uh, good evening everybody we are again meeting for yet another smart learning uh, class and these are lectures by very prominent urologists which are very sought after by most of the uh, students and today we have a brilliant urologist amongst us dr venkatesh krishnamurthy from anu hospitals bangalore besides being a brilliant urologist he is his approach is characterized by a very calm demeanor and an excellence in academics and we really will be honored to listen to him on a topic which is of growing interest in private practice for everybody at the outset i would like to request dr lakshman prabhu to give his opening remarks before we can set the ball rolling uh, thank you thank you very much sir uh, good evening venki sir you know ah, good evening probably <laughs> uh, i am uh, the probably do, uh, amongst those logged in i think i am a microscopic minority who has had the privilege of uh, closely following dr venkatesh krishnamurthy during uh, the medical college days subsequently during his ms training i missed him when he was doing mch and subsequently constantly we have been and uh, you know his tenure as kua so all this is personal but uh, i would only say one thing that uh, it is said that if you can't explain uh, and uh, simplify things then you are not understood it so and uh, when it comes to dr venkatesh krishnamurthy i can say that his assimilation powers and his understanding and his grasp of anything that is given to him is more than 100% so that's the reason why he has this uh, i would say the ability to simplify things i have come I have hardly come across any such teachers you know maybe dr mk mani is one person who could simplify things and in urological circles i i can't just simply can't think of anybody who can simplify things and make you understand so therefore this smart class on dysfunctional voiding assumes great significance in my opinion i bring warm greetings from the president of urological society india the council and without wasting much time i'm very eager to listen to him and uh, only one uh, observation i would like to make i would like to recognize the e presence of dr anil udyada he has been attending every meeting you know for long long time now during covid times and subsequently thank you dr anil that you know uh, in spite you know you must be a very busy urologist and in spite of your seniority and all the commitments you are always there i just wanted to as a uh, secretary i wanted to recognize his presence and uh, with that i would say that we are all lucky and eager to listen to dr krishnamurthy and um, maybe i think uh, 45 minutes of uh, you know deliberations and then maybe you give us a little more time to ask our silly questions and uh, they say that you you if you don't ask you will never learn so yes. that's, that's the basic dictum so I, i request all those who are logged in to you know pitch in with their questions uh, in the chat box and uh, the facilitators will take them to the resource person the facilitator thank you very much once again and uh, over to dr venkatesh krishnamurthy unless dr sujatha ma'am has something to say dr arun chawla no i think he is he is occupied with something over to you sir thank you so much thank you for the kind introduction of both dr gyanendra and dr lakshman i personally would like to meet this person whom you have spoken about i will start my talk are you able to see my screen yeah clearly sir yes. okay you thank can you can see i'll mute myself now my talk is going to be uh, on dysfunctional voiding a topic that is coming that has been there in the reckoning for the last two and a half decades yet not recognized often enough in our daily clinical practice i will start with this dysfunctional voiding and then also include bladder bowel dysfunction because quite often the two coexist let me start first with a case scenario clinical scenario 
A lot of it you will see will have to pediatric urology, but the point is that these conditions are present quite commonly among adults also. This girl, 17-year-old, presented with recurrent documented UTI for the last three years, needing hospitalization each time. High fever, chills, and renal angle pain. Urinary frequency was four to five bar zero. She had urgency. The rest of the history was unremarkable. Her bowel movement was normal. When I mention this bowel movement, you must, you must, everybody must understand that as urologists, at no point in our training are we asked or trained to look at the bowel in our training. But suddenly, when you talk of this uh, dysfunctional voiding or bladder bowel dysfunction, we find a lot of importance is given to bowel movement. And we must recognize this. I will come back to this later. Her menstrual cycles are normal. She was the only child. She was asymptomatic till age 13. Not the classical history of dysfunctional void. The ultrasound study showed one side kidney contracted. The left side was normal. The bladder wall was thickened with saccules. She had undergone cystoscopy and urethral dilatation. Again, a very common reaction from urologists to patients presenting with this kind of a female patients presenting with this kind of a history. She, despite the urine being negative for AFB, she underwent a six-month course of anti-tuberculosis therapy with no response. This was her MCU. The bladder, as you can see, is beginning to develop into a fir tree appearance. It's very trabeculated. The, void, the voiding film shows bladder ears, reflux on one side, and this kind of a bulbous proximal urethra. Eurodynamics had reported a small capacity bladder. The compliance, they said, was normal, but could very well be because of the reflux. Avoiding pressures were very high. She presented to us a DMSA at that time reported decreased function on the left side. The lumbar spine MRI was normal. We started with the bladder diary, very essential. Avoid frequency was only three times for 24 hours. Mark this because this is going to be a diagnostic criterion. Void volume. So what did we do to manage this? So the first thing we did was ensure that her void volumes did not exceed 250 ml because of her urodynamic report. We cut down on her fluid intake, ensured timed voiding, including waking up in the middle of the night to void. This was in 2006. Two months later, all her symptoms had disappeared. She had no UTI. She was doing midnight void daily. We had stopped antibiotics. Six months later, no UTIs. A bladder diary revealed a total volume of around a liter. The maximum void volume was 250 ml. Her frequency was 4 to 5 for 24 hours. Look at the appearance of the bladder now. You would think that the bladder would not respond, but this bladder now is a nice, smooth, globular structure. Her reflux earlier, which we saw on the left side, is now on the right side, but the point is that it's persisting and the urethra no longer has that globular appearance. Seven years later, her creatine is normal. We emphasized care of the solitary kidney. And 16 years later, she continues to be fine, married, asymptomatic, following urotherapy, ensuring good bowel movement. So this is the 
sort of gist of what you see, that is dysfunctional voiding, where you saw the posterior proximal urethra much like in a posterior urethral valve. It was dilated and then with just with urotherapy, timed voiding, appropriate fluid intake, everything has reverted to normal. The concern here, however, remains that as a child, she's had scarred kidneys. She has a solitary, what for all practical purposes, a solitary functioning kidney. And therefore, we need to follow her up lifelong to prevent CKD or ESRD. So let us look at what is this voiding dysfunction? So dysfunctional voiding is different from voiding dysfunction. Let me start first with voiding dysfunction. A group of abnormal holding and disturbed voiding patterns seen in children with no anatomical or neurological disease. So this has, as I said, primarily this has been reported in children, but we see this now in adults too. So before we look at just voiding dysfunction, let us understand what is normal voiding. Normal voiding when the bladder is filled and there's a sensation to void, the first step is relaxation of the external sphincters, the urethra. Opening of the urethra followed by contraction of the bladder. This is normal voiding. In dysfunctional voiding or different kinds of voiding dysfunction, there may be increased bladder pressures during filling itself, such as an overactive bladder. There may be increased bladder pressures with thickening of the bladder as we had seen in this girl, because the sphincter, as it is supposed to open, does not open, remains closed, either completely or intermittently, and therefore leads to grossly increased voiding pressures. Remember this, this is normal voiding with urethral relaxation preceding detrusor contraction. And this is detrusor contraction happening either during the filling phase or the voiding phase. So first let us look at this normal voiding. So if you look at the MCU, you see these are a series of X-rays. This is a normal looking bladder, nice funneling of the bladder neck, a tubular urethra going around, no obstruction. Again, these are males. Nice funneling of the bladder neck. You can even see the urethral folds over here and the veramontanum and the urethra crista. Female. In our practice, we normally leave a marker at the urethral meatus when we do MCU so that we know up to where we measure. We get all our measurements of the female urethra. Again, it's the same nice, smooth bladder wall, funneling of the bladder neck, straight urethra without any dilatation. So we understand what the normal urethra, normal voiding is. Now let us look at voiding dysfunction. There are different types of voiding dysfunction. One is the overactive detrusor. That is, as the bladder is filling, you find uninhibited contractions, which may result in sensation or urgency to void or even incontinence. The other extreme, the opposite end of the spectrum is the underactive detrusor, earlier simply labeled as the lazy bladder. The next is the inability to relax the sphincters, that is the striated urethral sphincter and pelvic floor complex during voiding. This is the classic dysfunctional voiding. And then something that goes hand in hand with this, which is dysfunctional voiding and dysfunctional bowel emptying, earlier known as dysfunctional elimination syndrome, but now term, the terminology is bladder bowel dysfunction. And then finally, the non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder, also termed with the archaic Hinman syndrome, which is end stage dysfunctional voiding with upper tract changes. 
So there are five different kinds of voiding dysfunction. The first is completely a filling phase dysfunction. The rest are a combination of filling phase or voiding phase dysfunction. So the filling phase dysfunction, detrusor overactivity and wetting plus or minus affects a lot of children. Typically, the parent's history in this will be, this child waits till the last minute, till the bladder is over full to run to the toilet. So you have to recognize that this child probably has an overactive bladder, maybe there are different kinds of overactive bladders, maybe the phasic or the terminal. So you will have to educate the parents that this child has a problem with the bladder and it is not that the child holds on till the very end, till the bladder is over full. To avoid wetting, these children adopt various holding postures. We are very familiar. We are very familiar with this. And this may be one one of the reasons for the genesis of dysfunctional voiding, which is in holding becomes a habit and relaxation does not happen when they try to void. So we've looked at what normal voiding is. We've looked at the different kinds of voiding dysfunction, including the filling phase abnormalities. Now we look at this dysfunctional voiding. The IC is definition. Intermittent and or fluctuating flow rate due to involuntary intermittent contractions. The operative word here is neurologically normal individuals. In neurogenic causes, it is termed detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. If it is non-neurogenic, then it is termed dysfunctional voiding. So here is the one of the things just for comparison, I put up normal bladder, nice funneling bladder neck, wide open, normal urethra, good urine stream. Look at this. Now, this is, look at this urethra. You will immediately recognize this is a trabeculated bladder, tiny sacules, shouldering at the bladder neck spindling of the urethra. Again, a similar picture, very narrow bladder neck, hypertrophy with a, this is in a male child. Remember, it's more common in females, but still present in males, and we need to recognize this condition. Again, dilated posterior urethra. This is so grossly dilated, the bladder neck is open and there is only a thin rat tail of the distal urethra. Same here. So the ICCS definition for this dysfunctional voiding in terms of voiding. So what happens if the sphincter is like this, the urethra is dilated? habitually contracts the urethral sphincter during voiding. The repeated uroflow shows a staccato pattern or unless verified by urodynamic studies. So when it was first described, the staccato pattern was taken to be the sign for non to diagnose dysfunctional voiding. Now we know and there is enough studies to show that different kinds of uroflow patterns also remain the same indicate the same pathology. So you find that this is a wavy pattern, a sort of blunted staccato pattern. If you give them treatment, then you find that this changes to a nearly normal flow. These are all various patterns that we see, all of which is for dysfunctional voiding, meaning these are proven, patients proven to have dysfunctional voiding, which is why I have put up these various patterns. Quite often, these are mistaken for urethral stricture, which is why I have put up these. And sometimes, see, you must understand that 
this dysfunctional voiding, you see it in the entire spectrum. It is not that you have to see them only when they reach the terminal stage and come up to the point of a staccato voiding pattern or gross wrist reliorin and so on. These patients present quite often in the urology OPD with burning urination or more often urinary tract infection. So this is the spectrum of the Euroflows and I want people, the postgraduates to understand that you can see various types of Euroflometry. Most of the time they are abnormal, but as I've shown, occasionally you may find that because the bladder is able to generate so much pressure, you can see what appears to be a normal flow. But if you see, even though it seems normal, you see there is a delay to peak. This itself, instead of being in the first one third, it is moved to the, it's moved to the right to the lateral, I mean, uh, later two thirds. So what is the evolution of dysfunctional void? Acquired dyssynergy, probably inappropriate toiling training, meaning they are asked to hold for various reasons. The toilet is dirty, don't use the toilet in school, uh, don't go so often, etc. Response to urgency, typically seen in an overactive bladder. Pelvic discomfort and constipation, often not considered. A persistent infantile voiding pattern and disciplinarian teachers at school. The presentation is very varied, frequency and urgency. As I said, overactive bladder, urge incontinence. They may present with voiding difficulty, urinary retention, and of a serious nature is when they present with UTI and abdominal pain. How do you evaluate? This is sort of a routine uh, slide in practically any condition pertaining to urology or any subject. History to cover all of the lower urinary tract symptoms and bowel habits, very important. Don't ask for, don't ask if there is constipation. Quite often, especially in children, in adults, yes, you will see them, but in children, they may not even know it's constipation because it is what they have used to for a long time. So ask details of the bowel habits. Is it a regular bowel movement? Is it hard? Use the Bristol stool score to assess how it is. A bladder diary, very essential. I won't go into the details of this. Basic blood and urine tests and X-ray KUB. This is very useful in looking at colonic fecal loading. Earlier, though we have seen thousands of these X-rays, the response was that this is a bad X-ray. It is not a bad X-ray. That is an X-ray crying out with the diagnosis to the treating physician. An ultrasound study of the abdomen and the rectum, especially in children. I will come to this because that's a good way of assessing bowel dysfunction. Beyond this, now we use, we use the services of a, a gastroenterologist who does bladder bowel uh, manometry, anal manometry, transit time, of uh, colonic transit time and so on. So there's a lot more that we can actually do. Euroflometry and MCU study, of course, very important to diagnose the dysfunctional voiding. Eurodynamics, if indicated. Is an MRI necessary? As I showed in the uh, clinical uh, classical index case, an MRI is indicated only if you have unexplained severe dysfunctional voiding. The yield in a routine MRI is very low, so really does not help in doing it as a routine. If there are cutaneous abnormalities, yes. 
the MRI makes much more sense. I've spoken of what is happening in the uh, lower urinary tract in terms of dysfunctional voiding and also connected it to what happens in the bowel. So the same dysfunctional voiding is just one part of a bladder bowel dysfunction, which means just as the bladder is finding it difficult to empty because of the pelvic floor dysfunction, the same thing happens in the bowel. Except that in the bowel, it may be a slow transit bowel, a lower level of unrecognized Hirschsprungs in children, or a classical same sphincter dyssynergia in the rectum. The constipation is important because it has an equal or more prominent adverse effect on UTI. It is one of the major contributors to urinary tract infection. Any child presenting with urinary tract infection do not leave out a history of bowel movements, both adult and children, you will be surprised. How do you identify constipation? Fewer than three bowel movements a week. One to three on the Bristol stool scale. This is standard, we use it all the time for our children. Fecal soiling is an alarming sign. It is always a sign of overflow, incontinence, fecal. Evidence of stool retention on the X-ray, KUB in the colon, and of course, a rectal examination showing firm or hard stools in the rectum. Is ultrasound used as a tool for constipation? Yes, it is. This of course applies to children, the mean transverse diameter at the lower end of the sacrum in the rectum, the mean diameter is 4.9 centimeters as against around 2 centimeters in the control. And you can actually, instead of taking repeated x-rays, you can use this ultrasound study to see whether the rectal diameter has reduced. These are some scary images of bladder bowel dysfunction. This child was actually posted for a colectomy till they gave enemas and found out that this child's problem was only a bladder bowel dysfunction. You can see this entire abdomen in this child is filled with fecal matter. Same here. And we see this quite often. The same pattern is in adults. One third of constipated children have UTI and vice versa. Remember, so when we talk of dysfunctional voiding in relationship to UTI, bad or poor bowel movement plays an important role. So what do we do? You treat the constipation, behavioral change first, you must ensure adequate laxatives and fixed times for the toilet. It cannot vary. Increase the amount of vegetable fiber in the diet. Fluid, drink, adequate water. There is a misconception that if you drink a lot of water, you will pass too as well. No. You need a certain amount of fluid in the colon that a high vegetable fiber diet and roughage itself will ensure that it retains fluid. The more water you drink, you are only going to pass more urine or burden the bladder more and make it worse, especially in a patient with dysfunctional voiding. Remember this. So this is quite often, you see, it's an off-the-cuff off therapy given to patients that, oh, drink three liters water, drink four liters water. There is really no scientific basis for this except for some anecdotal papers in the literature. But remember, when you're dealing with dysfunctional voiding, drinking more water is actually the opposite of what you should be doing. Adequate fluid in the colon is by enough roughage. 
So medical treatment, clean out if need be enemas. Quite often we admit children to administer enemas for four or five days before we put them on regular home therapy. Stool softening, maintain for two to three months till there is regular stooling without fear. There are different kinds of laxatives. I won't go into the details. Bladder bowel dysfunction has a significant association with reflux. Again, 30% have bowel complications, 60% have UTI. They have associated night enuresis as well as daytime wetting. Never go and do an anti-reflux procedure for VUR in patients with bladder bowel dysfunction. Unsuccessful surgical outcomes are the only result. In fact, VUR is labeled as primary VUR only when you have ruled out bladder bowel dysfunction. So what is fundamental in the management? Treatment of constipation, Appropriate fluid intake, which means do a bladder diary, you will know how much the patient needs. Very important in children. Children less than two, three years don't need more than 500 to 700 ml per day. There is a formula for it anyway. Timed voiding ensure that they empty the bladder often. Again, the bladder diary will tell you how much. High vegetable fiber diet. This is complicated. H plus 5 equals grams of fiber per day. You'll need a chart to see what has how much of fiber. We follow a thumb rule, which is 70% vegetable fiber at every meal. 70% of the meal should be vegetable fiber. Pharmacotherapy. Alpha blockers. You choose depending on what kind of voiding dysfunction is there. Prophylactic antimicrobials for a very short duration till you actually sort out the bladder bowel dysfunction. And of course, botulinum toxin, if you find that the overactive bladder needs treatment or you inject it into the sphincter, which has not responded adequately to the other kinds of lifestyle changes. I'm coming to that. So what are the other therapies? The first will be a biofeedback therapy, behavioral therapy, which is you teach them to sit, relax, and pass urine. Teach them to do time voiding so that they don't hold large volumes of urine. If the bladder has to hold large volumes of urine, then the sphincters tighten. So it is the opposite of what you need to do. Transcutaneous electrode nerve stimulation. This is done to the anterior tibial nerve. These are all things that need to be, I'm not going to the details, but yes, we can discuss this during question session. Sacral neuromodulation has also come in where you stimulate the S3 nerve. And in conditions where the child or the patient is unable to empty Support it by CIC till they are able to regain the bladder function. Remember, bladder bowel dysfunction is a multidisciplinary approach. All these people are required, but very important is the last line, which is aggressive follow-up. Don't ask them to come back after six months or a year. In the initial period, you'll have to see them maybe three to four weeks, then two monthly, three monthly, six monthly, till you know that they have settled in into a good regimen. How do you know? Yes, they have settled into a good regimen, and now you know that they are reached your objectives. Improvement in the peak flow, we know that the uh, Euroflow is one good indicator. Reduction in bladder overactivity, incontinence episodes, and urgency episodes have reduced or disappeared. Reduction in the sphincter dyssynergia, which is evident on the 
MCU, abolition of the spinning top sign, downgrading or abolition of reflux, abolition or reduction in UTI episodes, absence of post So there are several parameters depending on how each patient has presented that you can use as a marker to say, yes, there has been successful treatment. I'm not going to the details, but here, yes, there's another index case. I'm putting up these mainly because these are not diagnosed and they go doctor to doctor. This is a 29-year-old patient, two and a half years history of recurrent UTI with pyelonephritis and scarring, scarring of both the kidneys. Several doctors, several hospitals, several antibiotics, but she just continued to have urinary infection. This was her MCU. It is very scary as you can uh, see. That's highly trabeculated bladder, very dilated proximal urethra, and that is the marker there. So we did urotherapy. As you know, there is no precise definition for urotherapy and what all it encompasses, but overall it is just take fluids as much as you need. Don't take a lot of fluids at night. Leave a gap between fluid intake and bedtime. Timed voiding. And in her case, we had to inject bottle and toxin into the urethral sphincter. All her symptoms disappeared. She practiced all that we had taught her. Her bowel movements are normal. And after a long time, she actually went off on a long holiday. So what is it that I want to wrap up with? Voiding dysfunction is very common. Please pay attention to lower unit tract. Functional urology is occupying a larger, larger space in the urologist's daily practice. You have to be aware of these conditions to recognize it. 40% of children with UTI have voiding disturbances. There's a close relationship between constipation and bladder dysfunction. The goal of management should be to prevent upper tract changes either by avoiding UTI, uh, resolution of uh, reflux, uh, avoiding high bladder pressures and so on. These are the goals of management. This slide says it all. So it is a, it's a conjoint venture between the bowel dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, and resultant UTI. So the bladder and the kidney are victims of what is happening. This is something that we should be very careful with, especially when a patient has UTI, I mean, dysfunctional void. Do not use the term dysuria very loosely. Does dysuria mean UTI? No. Whenever a patient comes, says burning, don't label it as dysuria. Get into details whether this is during voiding, end of voiding, or at other times also, because each of this indicates a completely different pathology. I've spoken of this postpartum retention sends everybody into a TZ, primarily the obstetrician, and then puts a lot of pressure on the I mean, the consultant urologist. That means this patient already had what we called an underactive detrusor or the lazy bladder syndrome. Reassure the obstetrician. This is one of our patients with all this, what we marked out is the bladder. So you can imagine what is happening. Thank you. Dr. Giannan. Yeah. We have some questions in the chat box, sir. Dr. Sharma, would you take them up? Yeah. First of all, I would like to congratulate her for on a very difficult topic. Uh, sir, my first question is, do you think the incidence of dysfunctional voiding has increased in the last decade or specifically in the last five years? Okay. <laughs> Very good uh, question, Dr. Gyanendra. I'll tell you, 
So when we started diagnosing this more than, we started diagnosing and treating these patients more than 20 years ago. At that time, the incidence was confined only to the urban children. We did not see even a single case of these happening in children coming from the rural areas. So obviously, it was the lifestyle in the urban situation. Now, over the last five, six years, we are seeing that those who are in the semi-urban or semi-rural areas, both parents working, we see children coming up with this. Invariably, it is, I would say, poor parenting, pressures of having to run to the school bus in the morning, waking up late, school, bad school toilets or non-availability of toilets. There are so many reasons like this. So we see it spreading. So I would attribute two things. One is we are diagnosing it more often appropriately. And the other is that, yes, the incidence is spreading mainly because of a very different lifestyle. I will tell you two things in this. One of our patients was so addicted, one child was so addicted to um, watching uh, TV and the mobile, she would not, she would pass urine just once a day. She would not pass tools for nearly five, six days at a time. And the parents just thought that this was normal. Whenever uh, the child feels like, she will go and pass urine. Why worry about it? In another, was we've seen this happen across generations. So first, the mother came with recurrent UTI and failure to conceive because every time she would have UTI. And that was the same. She would not, she would not pass, uh, go to the toilet in the house because the grandmother used to insist that he wash her feet every time she visited the toilet. So she didn't want to go to the toilet at all. She would say, I'd go to the, use the toilet in the office. But when she went to the office, she would get busy in the office and not pass tools or urine. So she came with pyelonephritis, all that, and she had a lot of problems during her pregnancy. Unfortunately, the child also developed the same symptoms. So we see that this is a kind of uh, habit forming within the family. So yes, are we diagnosing more? Yes, we're di diagnosing more. Uh, sir, the next question I would like to ask you is that uh, once you, your talk, or, of course, the fact that one needs to have a very high index of suspicion to pick up these cases. Otherwise, very often these cases with UTI would be just treated with antibiotics and go from one to the other clinician because of the recurrence of UTI. Now, one important aspect in differentiating whether it's a dysfunctional voiding or it's a neurogenic bladder is to suspect a neurogenic cause. Now, in the absence of any obvious dimple or a tuft of hair or a nevus present, how do we really suspect that this is dysfunctional and not a neurogenic bladder? And a corollary to this particular question is, in which cases would you specifically ask for an MRI to rule out or confirm a neurological cause? Yeah. So there are uh, two different uh, streams in which you will want to do an MRI. For all practical purposes, all these will be considered only as dysfunctional voiding till proved otherwise. Which means if there is no lower limb weakness changes, if there are no uh, sacral uh, signs uh, on the external sacral signs of uh, something on the spinal cord, spinal dysgraphism, you will not suspect a neurological cause. The second is having diagnosed it as dysfunction voiding. If you find that the response to the therapy is not commensurate with all the effort being put in, at that time, you ask for an MRI because at that time, the chance of picking up something is much more. 
The other thing is that if you see any external signs, then it is better to either the child has undergone some surgery or you find that there is weakness, etc. Then yes, you go ahead and do a, an MRI to see if there is a neurological cause for it. So for all practical purposes, you take it only as dysfunctional mining and not neurogenic. But if they do not respond and it's a point of severe dysfunctional voiding, yes, then it makes sense to go ask for an MRI. And believe me, in the adults, it is all right. But in children, getting an MRI is not very easy. So there's a lot of struggle for the parents, for the child, sedation and all that. Yes, sir. Uh, no. Emphasized by you is the association of constant and uh, of course the fact that bladder dysfunction has come as a terminology. More Couple of questions that have come related to this particular thing. First and foremost, how would you advise toilet training in children who are at the age of three, four, five years? Second, is the use of Western commodes contributing to the development of this particular problem to a large extent? No. Uh, okay. So the first, there is no actually fixed age for doing toilet training, but there is, now there is a tendency to get them toilet trained uh, earlier. The point in toilet training is that you don't ask them to hold. You don't ask them to hold either passing stools or passing urine. So you will, there's a spectrum. So suppose the child wants to pass urine every half an hour, then you say, will you go? Yes, you will tell them to go, but then you find out why this child is passing urine every half an hour. Half an hour, one hour, whatever, appropriate, age appropriate. Now, if it's an infant, you know that they pass around 20 times a day, so you're not going to be bothered. But once the child starts going to school, that is where things change. Because the, if the child has an overactive bladder and he or she is not allowed to visit the toilet, then you start setting off this vicious cycle where they start controlling the urination and that becomes a habit. So you will have to tailor that. So basically toilet training is, what do we want? The um, core of toilet training is recognition of bladder fullness or rectal fullness and going and empty. That is the core of toilet training. That is what we mean by toilet training, which means you associate, you just tell them whatever you use words, etc. when they're going to pass urine, which is very common. Once that is done, then you leave it to the blood, I mean the body mechanisms to develop further. The other question is, uh, uh, is the Western toilet the cause? We've got, there's a lot of uh, work being done on this. Essentially, the toilet or the seat is not the uh, issue. The child, if it's for a child, they must be able to rest their feet on something. That is what is important. That is not a concern if you're using the Asian toilet. The Asian toilet is all in the squatting position. So that is not so much of a concern. If we are using the Western toilet, then use a toilet seat that is appropriate for the child. Don't make them sit in the adult commode where they can actually feel constantly, they feel they may fall through and have to hold on. This is a very common thing happening. And the second is that they must have proper feet, feet support so that everything is relaxed when they are passing stools or passing you. Third, of course, is the sensibility about dirty toilets. Somewhere you'll have to ask them to, I mean, you don't tolerate dirty toilets, but then you'll have to ask them to overcome that. Now, of course, sanitizers and tissues are used available in plenty post-COVID. So it would be a good thing to simply say, okay, if the toilet is dirty, wipe it, use sanitizer, wipe it, use it and go. Don't hold urine or stools. Sir, can you elaborate a bit on what is the pathophysiological mechanism 
due to which constipation results in bladder dysfunction? There are uh, several contributory factors. So one is that when the when the fecal loading continues to happen, it becomes a habit for the external sphincter to be in constant contraction. And then when it recruits the entire pelvic floor, you find that the habit continues not only for the anal sphincter, but the pelvic floor and the urethral sphincter. The second is that a loaded colon pressing upon the bladder increases bladder pressure and the irritability, and that also leads to trying to hold urine. And the third is that with constipation, you know that there is going to be a fecal bacterial overload. And this upsets the entire mechanism there, especially when it causes symptomatic UTI. And then the entire mechanism changes. So all these, all these factors contribute to uh, aggravating the situation. Sir, whenever a person or a child is having constipation, a clinician would advise laxative. Uh, is chronic use of laxative associated with side effects? Okay. So, uh, of course, we don't want any child to be, anybody, not only child, child or adult, we don't want them to be using laxatives in the long term. If you have to choose a laxative, choose a laxative that is both bulk as well as an osmotic laxative because it is more gentle. Currently, most used is the polyethylene glycol peg laxative, but that is when they use it for a short uh, period. But the emphasis, the dependence is not entirely on the laxative. The dependence is a combination of a high vegetable fiber diet and the laxative. So depending on what stage of this bladder bowel dysfunction you see the child, your, your therapy is going to change. So when you start this, suppose there has been a severe dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, then there may be colonic lethargy, slow colon. You will then have to uh, give both vegetable fiber, the laxatives, and wait for the keep the colon empty continuously. And then over a period of few weeks or months, the colonic transit time decreases. We have the pediatric gastroenterologist involved in some of our more difficult cases. They do transit time and find that some okay. of them have normal. <laughs> Some of them have a normal transit time. Some of them have a severely slow transit time. And then they do anal manometry. Now, some of our children have pressures of around 75 millimeters of mercury, not centimeters of water, millimeters of mercury in the anal canal, suggesting that there is a gross resistance to emptying of the colon. So will we result, I mean, will we completely depend only on laxatives? No, the laxatives is only to help loosen the stool, soften the stools, or even make it watery so that the colon gets a respite and gets back to its normal diameters. As I said, one of the parameters we see is an increased rectal diameter, mid-rectal diameter. That is only because of all the fecal loading. It has to be a combination of these to find, to make sure that we completely empty. Just like a, a bladder, which has lost its stone, then you start CIC, you keep doing CIC, do urotherapy, empty the bladder at safe bladder volumes and find that after a period of time, the patient starts voiding. Very similar scientific basis for emptying of the colon. There is a question by Dr. Kim Memon, the importance of voiding diary. Oh, <laughs> that is a separate lecture by itself. But <laughs> I would say that it is standard now. You are dealing with anything with the low urinary tract. A bladder diary is very essential. I have seen this carry to an extreme. We have three-year-old children being given two liters of water a day because the mother has read somewhere. The WhatsApp university has 
said that everybody must drink a lot of water. And the two liters of water, it's a surprise that the child hasn't gone into any other problem of fluid overload. So the bladder diary will tell you the other thing, at what volumes is this child voiding? Is it exceeding its normal safe bladder capacity? How much is he holding uh, overnight and the first void of the morning? So essentially we need to modulate all those, the fluid intake, the timed voiding, et cetera, when we're dealing with low unit tract dysfunction, and the cornerstone of managing that will be the a well done bladder diary. Yeah, sir. Uh, there is a question by Dr. Sujata. Uh, there is a practice to clean the urethral area or vulva after voiding amongst females or use wipes. Does it contribute to development of UTI? No, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. There is no lit literature in support of uh, this, but essentially uh, it is only a matter of personal hygiene that they want to uh, dry out, I wouldn't say wipe, but dry out the urine that is in the vulval uh, region. So we, I use this very commonly at a more practical level, at least the previous generation that was coming from the villages, all of them used to, the only recourse to water for their ablutions was the village pond, both for the cattle as well as for the human beings. And nobody ever, the entire village did not have pyelonephritis because of that. Secondly, you see children with nappies loaded with fecal matter forgotten in the course of a very interesting debate on TV. Parents are involved. It is removed much later and clean, yet these children don't come to you with UTI. They don't have UTI. UTI happens only when there is a basic dysfunction in the lower urinary tract or in the terminal bowel. In the absence of that, there really is no cause. None of these external factors contribute to UTI. So there are two questions pertaining to evaluation of neuroflometry and neurodynamics. Now, one is that would you recommend Euroflow with EMG in all these children? And secondly, would you recommend neurodynamics in all patients with suspected bladder ball dysfunction? Okay. No, we don't use neurodynamics as a routine. At all, neurodynamics reserved only when you find that you are still not able to achieve the outcomes that you want. As far as the EMG is concerned, unless you are the, it's a specialized center that is doing needle EMG, periurethral EMG, there is no point in using the patch electrode to do this because unless this dysfunction is recruiting the entire pelvic floor. You are not going to get any meaningful report from the EMG. The MCU gives all the answers that you uh, want. A properly done MCU, which means when I say properly done, in children, we don't advocate the use of a urethral catheter unless it's a very small uh, child and you're doing this for other reasons, but for purposes of uh, dysfunctional voiding, a toilet trained child, in, in where that is the age in which you see them, we do a suprapubic injection, fill contrast, the urethra is untouched and then we ask them to void. The child is very comfortable with it and you get an excellent, you've seen the images that I have shown you, that sort of gives you everything that you want to know without actually doing an EMG. Okay, sir, it's a uh, um, very common uh, question which is asked by majority of uh, the uh, women friends or my uh, uh, friends who are women, <laughs> who, which is asked is, is it necessary for uh, the girls who are in their adolescent age to use this uh, things like we wash and all those things. So, yeah, and no amount of uh, telling them 
uh, solves the uh, query because they are, uh, I think it's told by the gynecologist also that it's necessary. And so these habits of uh, vaginal douching and all continue into adulthood also. So because yeah, so the, the... No, there is absolutely no basis for doing a routine vaginal uh, douche. You are only upsetting the normal vaginal uh, flora. Again, I want to go back to some common sense things because we blindly take some Western literature or even some literature papers of uh, poor merit and would love to follow it. So you are in a government hospital. You see so many of these women patients who come to you with bad genital hygiene. A lot of them living, so many of them live on the streets of uh, Mumbai or they come from villages. They don't have access to a daily bath and great uh, genital hygiene. The toilets they use are not clean. How many of them actually have UTI? Nobody. Blindly we follow wipe from front to back, not back to front. We don't wipe at all. Here we use a health faucet or they use water. So none of this, you don't need, you can just do an epidemiological study and see that none of this actually makes sense. And we are missing the prime cause for this UTI in these people. And we resort to a lot of things which actually leads to a lot of other problems rather than actually solving the problem. Do you agree with me, Dr. Sujata? There's about yeah, this I, I look at I have usually these females as clients but as I told you the, the other queries are from the friends who are <laughs> so yeah, called yeah. belong to the middle class or the uh, upper yes. middle society yeah. the, another uh, question little unrelated to this is do you um, advocate the use of HPV vaccines in adolescent girls because that is also a very common uh, thing going yeah. on. Yes, of course. Yes, of course we do, but for a completely different uh, reason. We don't want them to get cervical cancer. Nothing to do with... Uh, because they, they now they, there's a lot of change in the younger generation. So sexual contact is much... It is not as taboo as it was uh, earlier. So in terms of protection, yes. And that is coming as a sort of guideline for vaccinations also. Yeah, because a few of uh, uh, these girls, they had landed up in repeated urinary tract infections and it was attributed to finally uh, viral uh, uh, UTIs due to HPV. So it was really, it's difficult to prove and disprove these things. Yeah. And um, sometimes you have no answers to convince people. Similarly, I have one more observation, sir, that adults who are obsessive uh, water drinkers, like they uh, just w w don't listen. And uh, uh, do you have any other way of convincing them? Like, uh, no. like children <laughs> who have... Uh, their parents to listen to, but some adults, like especially they have the only reason that my doctor told me was yeah, the which, usual stuff. Which is which is why I showed that uh, slide of, you know, this is a uh, knee-jerk response that we say, oh, infection, drink a lot of uh, water. And in fact, in our institution, Across the board, right from consultants to postgraduates, all of us give the opposite advice, which is cut down. They, they come, some of them are drinking seven liters, eight liters of water. Uh, and uh, they, they void volumes, individual void volumes on the bladder diary ranges from one liter to 1.5 liters. Now, how do you expect that bladder to put up with this? Of course, if there is no dysfunctional element, then they don't get UTI, but otherwise. So we tell them water only as much as required. And the bladder diary will tell us how much that individual requires. That depends on the kind of work they do, the environment in which they are, the kind of physical uh, labor that they do, the kind of sports activities they are involved in, so, so many things. The kind of 
food they eat and how much water the food contributes. So the bladder diary is the foundation for managing uh, urotherapy in these patients. Yes, thanks. So, uh, Dr. Sharma, do we have some more questions in the chat box? Uh, I think there is only one more question that has come just now. Uh, yeah. So, this is about uh, the EMG. Yes. EMG. yes. See, uh, across, across the board, all over the world, the dependence or the uh, reliance on uh, the EMG tracing ranges anywhere from 10% to 40%. That is all. If you look at uh, Paul Abraham's book, he says uh, only 10% of EMG is reliable in all the Eurodynamic studies done uh, anywhere. So it depends on how it is, how it is done. And do you really need the EMG for all the studies that you are uh, doing? An EMG would be very helpful, uh, definitely when you're dealing with a frankly neurogenic uh, bladder. But in a dysfunctional voiding, I would say yes, if you can place it properly and then the, it is done well, yes, it may give you, especially when you have bladder bowel dysfunction or right now we see this uh, hypertonic pelvic floor in which you find that maybe you will see something. Otherwise, I really don't think that it is uh, doing too much of a difference if you don't record it. There is one uh, thing on dose and injection. No, okay, sorry. In fact, you can go ahead. This was the question. Dose and injection yeah. technique of giving Botox in the sphincter. Okay. So, to the sphincter, it varies. Uh, you can do either endoscopic injection or the uh, from the periurethral injection. In female patients, it is a simple thing to do it around the urethra, that is into periurethral. You have about three quarters of a centimeter thickness periurethrally for you to inject. The importance is to see that your needle is going parallel to the urethra. This is a very difficult thing. So what we generally do over time, we found that some of these patients do not respond to Botox uh, into the sphincter. So we now we leave a urethral sound like a Hagar's dilator. So if the needle enters the urethra, then we know that it will scrape against this, you can make out. Two, if you had seen the MCU images, we know we put a marker at the urethral meatus, so we know the extent of the dysfunctional sphincter. It varies in different uh, patients, anywhere from about one centimeter to 2.5 centimeters. So I know to what extent I must use the, pass the needle at the different. So normally we do it in four different, 10 o'clock, 10 to uh, five and uh, seven. Uh, his choice is different, 10, six, whatever. We also know that the uh, sphincter muscle is much more than the anterior uh, region. So in female patients, it will be periurethral injection. If you want to be very particular, then you can measure the length of the dysfunctional segment and inject it to that length. Very small children, we use 50 units, but the older children, we use 100 units. We don't have a problem with it. Unlike the neurogenic bladder, that is the detrusor sphincter dysynergia, for some reason, we find that in patients with dysfunctional voiding, once you break the cycle, there's really no need to keep repeating these injections. And that is a huge difference between the neurogenic and these patients. In the, so the question also from Dr. Chawla, could you, uh, can I just read it out for you, sir? Sure, I think sir. It, uh, in the whole gamut of voiding dysfunction in children, which anti muscarinics do you choose? And have you used beta 3 agonists in children? And do you use baclofen, alpha blockers in your practice? 
for any uh, type of voiding this function? I use everything. We use everything. We know now that except in very young children, the beta-3 agonists are also permitted to be used in uh, children. Regarding the anti muscarinics of course, you choose the one that is best. If you are going to keep it long-term, we know that the long-term use of these drugs can cause cognitive impairment in the extremes of age. So you choose your uh, drugs well. Do I use uh, baclofen? We use baclofen very commonly. Uh, start with the BD dose and go on to a PID uh, dose. We found some very good uh, improvement in these uh, patients. And if you actually see, we seem to be a little slow in using these drugs. Whereas if you go to a neuro rehab center, they use drugs left, right and center. They are using it with impunity and it actually makes a lot of difference to these patients, especially those with the uh, hypertonic pelvic floor. Those who come with the pelvic floor uh, pain syndrome, those are the hypertonic pelvic floor. It makes a remarkable difference in these patients. Actually, botulinum toxin is our last result. We don't use it right in the beginning. In the main child, we use endoscopy and do, but even in that, now they have needles that are attached to an EMG electrode. So as you advance the needle from the perineal region, you can actually make out when you hit the sphincter and then you can inject the uh, Botox. Any further questions, madam? Uh uh, so actually, like, uh, lots of questions can be asked, but I think we are yes. into the time schedule, and uh, uh, sir is definitely an authority. And I think practically there are so many things to learn from uh, him, and I think the uh, learning is unending, <laughs> at least from my side. <laughs> Thank oh, no. you very much. Even for us, we will keep learning. And practicing. One suggestion which has days. come up with. One suggestion which has come up in the chest bo chat box will have to be pursued by the uh, ISU is uh, have a separate class on voiding line. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. I think that is very important. Somehow it is glossed over and I find that a lot of patients who are being treated for lower urinary tract symptoms don't have a bladder diary at all. When actually it is considered a standard procedure when you are dealing with low urinary tract uh, dysfunction. And uh, following it to the T, as this has been discussed several times, Paul Abrams, the others, everybody says that you must do it for three days. Two days, but three days. The guideline, if you see the ICS guideline says it need not be consecutive, but it does not make sense because if somebody is going to do a bladder diary only on the weekends when he is at home, it doesn't make sense because then that is very selective. So our practice is that we do it three consecutive days when at work. We actually tell them, don't feel ashamed. Don't feel embarrassed that you carry a beaker to the toilet every time you go. In fact, you must educate all the other people in your office about the importance of a bladder diary and what benefits you get from it. So actually that changes. So they now, everybody, they simply take that uh, beaker to the um, toilet and actually talk about it, which is actually a huge plus point. Very true, sir. Ma'am, uh, with uh, your and Chawla sir's permission, can we end this session? Because I think, as you said, the questions are so much that you need another session to complete the list of all the questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Venki, for your... Uh, yeah. Thank uh, you. Madam, can I, can I come in? You know? Yeah. Since sure. the Indian school, since the Indian school has pl planned two more events for the trainees, that is, uh, I think, Indurep and then subsequently one more activity. I think Indurep in two locations. All these things can be included in that. In that, in, uh, in, in those sessions, 
where there can be actually a direct contact with the facilitator and they can ask more questions and more time and leisure. And that is how they are going to be designed. And this is a, just a thought which came to my mind. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for reminding me. I please announce two announcements that we are having a, a, a new program which is similar to Euro Rep and we are, uh, Chawla sir has uh, named it as Indu Rep and it will be a student um, student centric uh, program in Mumbai. The first of Indu Rep will be on the 29th and 30th of July and it is for the students and by the students themselves. So please look out for our uh, brochure and flyer, which would be soon at the USI website. And um, please do attend and pass on the information to students, all the teachers who are attending this webinar. And uh, is Chawla sir, uh, Chawla sir, could you announce the one also? What's that ma'am? Uh, AUA, AUA, uh... Yeah, ma'am. AUA. What I am doing is I am trying to put this uh, the folder actually in the chat box. I was, but I couldn't do it. I was struggling. I think. Uh, what, yeah, Answer. but I, I, yeah, but we can announce that. We can announce that one. Um, if we have time, and Dr. Venkatesh is there. Yeah, yeah, I am here. Sir, uh, I think first I should. Uh, uh, congratulate you for a very brilliant and very, very crisp presentation. I think there are many things to learn. For me, sitting, enjoying from the phone, actually, my laptop was not, uh, uh, the camera system was not good, so I enjoyed from the phone. But uh, I stayed uh, glued and and uh, I I think I, I had some few ideas, uh, which I'll share from the, uh, as a part of Indian School of Urology uh, Office Bearer, which I'd like take your help uh, on this subject only. That is number one. Um, number two is for the regents who are attending, as Madam has uh, told regarding uh, the Indurate program. One which is uh, coming in the August on uh, 19th and 20th of, uh, 20th of August is another program which is a collaborative uh, program of AUA, USI and Indian School of Physiology. Uh, this is going to be... Uh, AUL, AUA, USI, ISU, lesser than urology. This is based on three themes where we have uh, at least three faculty from AUA, which will be coming. This program will be held in Hyderabad in the DRL Leadership Academy. Uh, these three AUA faculty are masters in the three separate themes. And so you will have these themes thoroughly covered in the form of didactic lectures and some uh, case discussion as well as the expert comments. Uh, Regents do play a very important role in asking questions and getting their doubts clear from this AU faculty. At the end of uh, this program is a very uh, interesting exam which is uh, framed by the AU faculty. This is the MCU question and this uh, question you attempt, this is a physical uh, answers to the MCQs which are sent by the central office back to the AUA office and this get evaluated. And from the evaluation, you get a feedback of the AI faculty that you are these specialties are strong and you need to work on these areas. It's an excellent program, but there's a cash rate is that you need to become a member of AU agent uh, uh, this, uh, on the website. You have to go. We have circulated the link. We are sending it by mail. We are sending it by WhatsApp. You will be seeing a flyer coming. You will be seeing the mail coming. You will be seeing the... Uh, this information from your colleagues, friends, teachers. Um, the fee is very nominal, just 25 US dollars, but the benefits are too many, not only attending this, but uh, the access to the AEO website in the form of using all the all the uh, material, learning material, which is there in the AU University, uh, getting chance to interact with the uh, AEO faculty during the time of uh, this webinar. And you need have some, you need some exposure uh, or some uh, uh, some observership. These faculty act as a bridge uh, uh, between you and the uh, uh, the area or the center where you want to uh, join or spend some time. So I urge you to just keep uh, a watch over the what is being circulated and try to become member as early as possible. Because the last date is 30th June. Thank you very much, and over to you, ma'am. And Dr. Dr. Chawla, uh, yeah. in fact, one more request letter has gone from the USI Secretariat to all the HODs, whatever database yes, we have. Yes, and, sir. Uh, we have, I have made a specific plea 
to all the HODs to motivate their residents at least two or three uh, so that they can plan their uh, schedule. Because even Excellent. the HODs need to know these things in advance, the dates. Uh, so if you just circulate it amongst the residents. So therefore, this initiative has been taken from my end. Yes. Uh, we'll yeah. have to follow it up with telephonic calls. Yeah, so, so we are doing that. And at the same time, we are also getting uh, the different... Uh, Dr. Jatha is also working in talking to HRD, sending mail to HRD along with the flyer. We are doing that. So we are no, no, this, trying yeah, to get the maximum the participation number. as well as the maximum membership. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Venkatesh, I'm uh, sorry we, it gets... Uh, it gets clouded in our uh, in communication. But again, uh, thanks on behalf of ISU. Excellent talk. Thank Thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.